So lesson eight, our next lesson what we're going to talk about is a really uh, great feature that we have in ASM called DataGuard. And DataGuard is used specifically to achieve PCI compliance. So we're also going to talk a little bit about PCI compliance. And we're going to start by talking about PCI compliance. What is PCI compliance, also known as PCI DSS, which is Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard? So this is a standard that was created by the, 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 the credit card companies out there. Uh, it was created in 2004 to help prevent fraud. So the, the card holder, the card man, the, the visas and the MasterCards, they're the ones who got together to come up with these standards that we're going to talk about. Designed to reduce credit card fraud. That's the whole point of it. And it is mandated, which is why we have PCI requirements that we have to adhere to. There is a PCI Security Standards Council that performs auditing. The amount of auditing an organization goes through to determine their PCI compliance depends upon how much activity they have, how many transactions they have for, on their web application. Are they an Amazon? or are they mom and pop, you know, giftshop.com. So when they got six million plus transactions a year, they're at a level one, they're getting audited regularly. And it goes all the way down to less than 20,000 transactions a year, they've become a level four. And you can see more information on this if you really would like, if you're curious, I got this right off of Wikipedia, and you can really go see more specifics about these four very distinct levels. And, of course, it's important for all organizations to know what level they are and how often they're going to be audited by the PCI Security Standards Council. Now, PCI compliance was uh, the requirements, the PCI DSS requirements. When they put this together, they came up with six separate requirements. Having a secure network ensuring that your network itself is secure. Then ensuring that we, the organization, is securing the cardholder data once they have it. Going through basic vulnerability management, identifying vulnerabilities and, and, and having some sort of a routine uh, checks on their web applications and so forth. Access control. This is talking about having access to things like cardholder data. Who has access to this? Who can see the data that all the Amazon users are, are supplying? How often are they doing testing and monitoring? And then finally, basic IS, uh, information security uh, standards. Now, if, you, if you're familiar with some of the, the basic security standards. These really kind of fit into a lot of the, those basic security standards that organizations should have some sort of a security plan for. Um, there's just a couple of others that are kind of more specific to the credit card industry. Now, if these six categories weren't enough, they're actually all, all but uh, one are broken up into multiple subcategories, starting with uh, maintaining a secure network. Two subcategories for this. The first is they must have a firewall configured and installed and so forth. And all passwords for all systems, their firewalls, their IPS, everything, they must be secure passwords, not the default passwords that come with those systems. So those are the two subcategories to ensure we have a secure network. Then we have the categories, the subcategories for secure cardholder data. We must ensure that all the cardholder data that we have, all the credit card numbers and transact, uh, 
credit card numbers, expir uh, expiration dates, and so forth, that's got to be very secure in our network, in our uh, database. And then, any time this credit card data is going across public networks, it's got to be encrypted. You would think that would be obvious, but back in 2004, when these standards were set up, not always so obvious back then. Then we've got our vulnerability management. A couple of uh, subcategories here. Uh, antivirus software must be used within our network. And then secure systems and applications. This is really talking a lot about the end user systems and uh, our Windows operating systems or whatever uh, servers we're using. Now you might be saying to yourself right now, huh, these don't all seem to apply to ASM. And you would be right. These don't all apply to ASM. This is a PCI DSS standards that I'm sharing with you. ASM helps with some, but not all. So these two really ASM can't do much about. We can't ensure that they have antivirus software on all of their client computers. Under access control, we've got some subcategories. Um, cardholder data access must be restricted to on a need to know basis. Who can see it? Every person with access to any of our computer systems like our IS servers, our SQL servers, uh, everybody must have a unique user ID. We're not all just logging on as administrator you know, with the administrator password. And then physical access to cardholder data must be restricted. Physical access to the data. That's all under our access control. Network monitoring and testing, a couple items here. Anytime there is access to the cardholder data, are we tracking it? Are we monitoring it? You must be to be PCI compliant. And we should be doing regular testing, showing proof of regular testing of all of our systems, all of our security. That is a PCI requirement. And then finally, under information security, this is very much very similar to having just a standard, secure, a, a standard security policy in place. Same idea. This should all be documented well. So these are all the 12 subcategories of PCI compliance. Now, let's talk about PCI compliance and ASM. Because as I said, not all of these apply to ASM. We can do that with ASM. We can do that with ASM. We can do that with ASM. We can do this with ASM. We can do this. We can do that. Those are the one, two, three, four, five, six of the subcategories that an ASM security policy can help a company become PCI compliant. So this has been a little information and history about PCI, PCI compliance, all these requirements. But now what we're going to talk about is how can we use a security policy in ASM to achieve these highlighted requirements. The first thing we want to look at is a fantastic, amazing report that we have under our ASM reports called our PCI Compliance Report. This comes with ASM. You'll see right here it tells you, explains exactly what this is for help a company maintain their PCI DSS uh, requirements um, and so forth. Make sure again we're looking at the correct security policy. Now you can see all those 12 subcategories. These are all the ones we just looked at. But you'll notice a few of them have NA, not applicable. Those are all the ones that the ASM can't do anything with. So the things that ASM can do something with, we have some icons over here. Right now we got a lot of red X's. You can probably tell right off the bat that the red X, not so good. That means we are not compliant. Ah, there's my security policy. 
So that's the security policy we're checking right now. Uh, and here's our reminder. There's our six different highlighted requirements, or we'll call it sub-requirements, sub-requirements. And as I said right now, under our complete compliance state, we are not compliant. So we're going to look at how we can make each of these compliant. We do have one that is compliant already. That's good. Now it is possible that it will have a third icon. We have the NA, the green checkbox, the red X. You may see this. This is your way of knowing that this sub item, it's a little bit more complicated. It's not just turning something on or turning something off. It's something that's going to take a little bit of extra work and it's possible that this is partially done. And I can actually see that if I open that up and then scroll down a little bit, you'll see that some of the things required to make that subcategory compliant are done, but others are not done. Thus, the, uh, the yellow symbol, the yellow icon. Now let's see what we're going to have to do to achieve PCI compliance for each one of these. And then we'll look at each one in a little bit more detail. For this number two, we cannot be using our big IP default username and password of admin admin and root default. For number three, that's what we're going to use our feature data guard for. We'll look at that in a few more minutes. Data guard is going to help us achieve compliance there. For number four, the virtual server must be using HTTPS. As long as it's using HTTPS, we're going to be compliant. For number six, develop and maintain secure systems. For that, we need to have a, we'll call it a rock solid uh, security policy. And remember in lesson six earlier to, uh, yesterday, our attack signatures, section. Uh, actually, that was in Lesson 6, but yesterday we talked about attack signatures. Remember that not all attack signatures may be enforced. And remember that if attack signature is not enforced, it doesn't get blocked. This only becomes compliant when all the attack signatures are enforced. And number eight, we have to have more than just one username and password on the big IP system. Even if it's just admin with a new password, that's not good enough. Every big IP system administrator should have their own username and password. And then the last one is we have auditing enabled. So that's why this one's already enabled. So as long as we have auditing enabled, we can uh, achieve PCI compliance because we're tracking and monitoring and so forth. What's really nice about this is remember that one of the things that we needed, uh, number 12, maintaining the policy, uh, maintaining, we need tangible, something to show an auditor. And we have that available over here in our printed, printable version. Uh, when, we print, when we click on that, we're going to get a PDF. We pull up this PDF. This PDF has all of the information. It's got the description. It's got you know, all the six sub items, they're all green checks. It even gives you great details about each one of these, even the ones that ASM doesn't protect, having, you know, a firewall configuration and so forth. Usernames and passwords and so forth. And then when we get down to um, the secure systems, we can see that our signatures for all of these vulnerabilities are enforced. That's why we have all the green check boxes. So really nice, easy way to show PCI compliance. So most of those things are real simple. Adding usernames for the big IP system, changing the default username and password, making your virtual server an HTTPS virtual server. You all know how to do that. The one thing we need to talk about now is how to achieve that one subcategory that requires Data Guard. So here's what Data Guard pre prevents against. I have a web page. This is our DDWA page. You've seen this before. And I've inserted in some, some comments here. And then those comments 
are now in my database of my DDWA server. And now every time I click on this, I see the list of comments, which means I'm going back to the server and saying, give me all your comments. And all of these credit card numbers are being returned in the HTTPS response. That is not PCI compliant. So we could fix this in a couple of ways. One way is we could go have our web application developer, the guy that we're spending that, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars an hour on, we can have him change all those web pages so that it stops sending this information back in the HTTPS response. Or we can use DataGuard. When we use DataGuard, oh, and by the way, also notice we got a social security number here. This is a US social security number. As I said, to fix this, we have to fix all that web application code. That could take, who knows, hours, days, weeks. Or I could use DataGuard, as I said. This could not be any easier, and I'm not joking. This could not be any easier. We go to our DataGuard page. Again, make sure we're looking at the right security policy. Simply one checkbox to enable DataGuard. You'll notice that by default, it is going to apply data guard to you, uh, credit card numbers and social security numbers, US social security numbers. The purpose of data guard is to mask. So what we want to make sure is that this doesn't inadvertently block a request just because a credit card number is coming back in the response. We don't want to block that. What we just want to do is mask out the sensitive data. In this case, the credit card numbers or the social security numbers. So that's what the mask data is going to do. So that is what the mask data is going to do for us. Now notice we're getting a notice here. It says, hey, since the security policy is configured to block the data guard information leak and leakage detected and detected violation, this setting has no effect and is relevant only if delay blocking, of session tracking, well, that's a lot of garble there. But it's talking about a violation, a, a blocking violation. So question to you, where do you suppose in the big IP ASM pages we can look at this violation, this data guard violation? Any guesses? Where do we, where do we configure most of our blocking settings? that is done under the application security uh, policy builder. Under the learning and blocking settings page. Under the learning and blocking settings page. Let's take a look at what it's talking about here. Here's my learning and blocking settings page. I'm gonna go down. I have a data guard section. What it's talking about is that right now, this data guard setting is set to block. That's the default. What that means right now is, as soon as I turn data guard on, it's actually gonna block responses that have credit card numbers in them. I don't wanna do that. I just wanna mask them. So I just need to make sure to remove that. Now it is possible, maybe you want to block them. Maybe you do. But in this case, I do not. So I'm gonna uncheck that, now I'm gonna save my policy, apply my policy, I'll go back to my uh, page where I go and ask for all those comments and I bring them back. And now you'll see that all the sensitive data, the credit card numbers and the social security numbers are now being masked. So we still get the response, we're not being blocked, but we have no more information leakage. And that's how simple data guard is to use. That's how simple it can be to use. But what if uh, there's a couple of different scenarios here. One question that I get a lot, I've gotten this question for many years that I've been teaching ASM. What if I wanted to show at the end, maybe the last three or four characters of the number to the user? Well, unfortunately, the data guard feature that we just saw by default, that won't let us do that. It's either all or nothing. Gonna mask it all, or we're gonna leave it all empty. 
but we can create what's called a custom mask. So, for example, uh, we have another very confidential piece of data, a United Kingdom national insurance number. Somebody submitted that comment and, oh look, even though social security numbers are being masked, that's not being masked. ASM doesn't know about that, 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 that pattern. So a custom pattern is going to let us mask any kind of data. Uh, it could be a number like the UK number or a Asia ID number or credit card numbers just the three first three sets. We can mask anything we want as long as we can define it. So the things we need to know is we need to know the format. So this format of this UK, it's like a, a letter, a letter, and then one, two, three, four, five, six numbers, and then another letter. We need to know this format. And then you need to know a little bit about regular expressions. Regex. And uh, so if you know a little bit about regular reg expressions, you're going to be ready to go. If not, we're going to cover it just a little bit so that you can see how to do this. So as I said, this number starts with two letters and then six numbers and then followed by a final letter. That is the format of the UK national insurance number. That's all I need to know. But what if they put it in this way, which is, a, which is also, as I found on Wikipedia, considered to be a way that people enter in their UK national insurance numbers. That's actually a different format. That's a B, that's a two letters with a space, and then two numbers with a space, and two more numbers with a space. So those are actually two different masks, two different custom patterns that we have to think about. So let's talk a little bit about regular expression. This is just kind of fun, new lesson on something totally different, not F5 related, but it is important if you want to be able to create some custom masks. So when you're creating a custom, uh, excuse me, when you're doing a regular expression, any time you have a letter, A through Z, that will always represent that literal letter, literal letter. Anytime you have a number, 0 through 9, that will always represent that literal number of 0 through 9. Anytime you have this, the bracket A through Z bracket, that will now represent any one letter from A to Z. So for example, A, M with this, would match AMA, it would match AMM, and AMY, but not ABA, because the two first letters have to be AM, they're literal letters. And it also would match AM9, because this needs to be uh, 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 some sort of a letter. And it also won't match this, because it treats it case sensitive. So these have to be capital A through Z, interestingly enough. Very similarly, this would represent any number from 0 to 9. Any number. So for example, AM with this followed by a 0 would match AM30, AM80, but not AMM0 because that third character has to be some sort of a number or AM39, because the last number has to be a zero. We good so far? Yes. When I have a series of any characters inside of the brackets, without the hyphen there, that means it could be any one of those five characters. So I could have A, C, M, X, and then it could be any one of those four characters. Only one of them. So this could mask 
BE, BO, but not BY, because Y isn't one of those characters, not DO, because D isn't the first letter, and not B capital U, because this is a small U. Interesting, isn't it? And then many keyboard characters match as the same keyboard characters, so like literal text like this. So if I put a hyphen in my mask, that represents an actual hyphen. If I put a percent sign, that represents a physical percent sign. So for example, A through Z hyphen 0 through 9 will match A hyphen 2 and T hyphen 9 but not A2, because you need that literal hyphen represented by that, and not T hyphen hyphen 9. <laughs> that also would not match the mask. A period represents any character, any character at all. So B through D will match letters B, C, D only, in lowercase. So, B through D with any character, followed by B through D. Remember, this is any character. So it'll match bed, and bad, and even dad, and even this, any keyboard character. But not bead, because it's only one keyboard character that it can match. And not bar, because the last letter there, R, is not between B and B. And then, finally, I think this is one of the final ones here, we have the curly braces with a number. The curly braces lets us say, I want this many of something. I want this many of something. So, let's say I wanted to represent any four-digit number. I could just say 0 through 9, 0 through 9, 0 through 9, 0 through 9. That will mask any four-digit number. But I can also represent it this way, 0 through 9 with the 4 in a curly brace. Now it's saying any 4 of that item. So here we go. Now we're getting closer to really identifying how we create a custom mask. So F5 hyphen with 0 through 9 in brackets and a 4 and a curly brace, that's now going to match F5 hyphen 1, 2, 3, 4, because it's F5 hyphen with any four numbers, and F5 hyphen 7878. Seven, but it's not going to match this, because there's no hyphen in this. And it's not going to match that, because that last character is not 0 through 9. So we're getting closer to seeing how to identify that UK uh, insurance number where we knew the first two characters had to be any two letters and then the next characters had to be six numbers and so on. So let's build that. Let's build that UK national insurance number custom mask. There, that was an example of it. So. First part of it, we could use either of these two. Any letter followed by any letter, or any letter twice. These two represent the same thing. And then I've got six numbers. It's going to look very similar. I like this better, by the way. It's cleaner. For six numbers, I could do this. Zero through nine, zero through nine, zero through nine. Or I could do this. Which one do you think is better? Second. Second one, sure. And then finally, any number, any one number. That, Letter. boom, 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 that is the custom mask to identify any UK insurance number as long as it follows in that format. That's what our regular expression custom mask will look like. Ah, but what about this option? Remember, that's a separate mask. But not, not a whole lot of extra work, but we have to account for these spaces now. So now, I'm going to have a, any letter twice, and then this is a space right here, followed by any number twice, and another space. 
another two numbers followed by a space and so on. So I need to account for the possible different ways somebody could enter some of these codes. So that, how much fun was that? That was our introduction to creating regular expressions. Uh, and that it will give you so much more capability when you go in to create, with, to use DataGuard, to play with DataGuard. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my custom patterns Inside my new pattern, this is where I'm going to put those regular expressions we just looked at. A through Z, twice, 0 through 9, 6 times, A through Z, twice, I click on Add. And then I've also added the second one that accounts for the spaces. I can add as many entries in here as I want. And as soon as I save this and apply the policy, and I go back and look at my page, now I see that both versions of uh, the uh, number are masked. So, but, ah, there's some that are not masked. Hmm. Why is the first one not masked? Why did that get masked? Anyone, can you tell? Seven numbers. It's seven numbers, that's right. It doesn't match the mask. Why did the second one not get masked? Let's say again. Because of the dashes. Yeah, they use dashes yeah. instead of spaces. Now, if this is another valid way that people might enter these numbers, well, we might have to add a third mask. Why did the last one not get masked? <laughs> because of the lowercase. Because of the lowercase, correct. Again, if this is how people might enter their numbers, we might want to add additional masks with lowercase characters. Very good. So in your, uh, so that's our data guard section and our PCI compliance. Uh, in your exercise, you're going to do a couple of things. Um, again, you're going to start a whole new policy. You're going to create a new policy. You're going to see this idea of information leakage with credit card numbers and social security numbers. You're going to go look at your PCI compliance report. And you're going to see that there are a few things that are not compliant. So we're going to fix all the items that aren't compliant including adding data guard, and then you will have a completed PCI compliance report, and that'll be good to go. And then you'll finish by creating some custom masks. And I believe, if I remember correctly, I believe that will also include accounting for credit card numbers leaving the last four digits visible.